Okay, another uh, mission that just uh, really has started is Juno at Jupiter. Uh, Juno arrived in Jupiter orbit uh, on July 4th, and uh, it entered into a, about a 53 and a half day long, very elliptical orbit. And uh, just uh, a couple days ago on uh, the 27th, they made another close uh, pass by Jupiter, just about 4,000 kilometers above the cloud tops. And this is the first time that they've actually had all of their science instruments turned on. When they did their orbit insertion maneuver, all of the, uh, the instruments were in uh, um, sort of standby mode so that the computer system on board was concentrating, if you will, completely on the, the maneuver to, to get it into orbit. And uh, so just uh, to give you a scale for this again, it's a, a huge spacecraft, these very large solar panels. It's the first time we've ever sent a solar-powered uh, spacecraft beyond uh, the asteroid belt. And uh, so they need lots of, of solar panels. And even though they've got these huge solar panels, I think the output is something like 500 watts at, uh, at Jupiter because it's uh, it's something like 1 25th the amount of uh, solar energy as we get at the Earth. So this is uh, just showing you why they're in these big elliptical orbits. What they really want to do is dive in through the magnetic field of Jupiter, get close to the cloud tops, and then get out of there as quick as they can. Um, the radiation environment is very damaging to the electronics uh, on board, so they think they're only going to survive uh, about 18 months of doing this before they have to uh, turn things off and actually dive the spacecraft into the atmosphere of Jupiter. Um, and so it takes you know, 53 days to go all the way out and then just uh, a matter of uh, less than a day to do this entire path where they uh, very quickly get close and, and then uh, very quickly move away. Um, and so this is uh, just a, a view of the, the entire mission, uh, their orbits. So this was when they were coming in before the, the orbit insertion maneuver. Jupiter is right here. And so the first orbit took them all the way out here, 53 and a half days. It was the end of July when they uh, got um, as far away as they, as they get at the apo apses, if you will. And uh, now they're, uh, they're moving away from Jupiter. They'll do one more of these 53 and a half day orbits. And in the middle of October, they do their uh, closest approach. They do another uh, maneuver with the rocket engines and shrink the orbit down to 14-day orbits. And then they do uh, um, about uh, 32 of those orbits before they uh, end the mission. So this is uh, just a simulation of if you were sitting on Juno, what does it look like? So you spend most of your time far away from uh, Jupiter. This is the 14-day orbit, by the way. And then you move back in, and very quickly you come from North Pole over the equator, South Pole, and then uh, move out again. And so that's, uh, that's the, what we're expecting to get images of. Um, so far, they've released one image from the uh, um, this encounter, and this was actually taken about 12 hours prior to the closest approach. So this is the north polar region. There's the great red spot. Um, they're promising by the end of this week to have a sort of a time lapse of uh, several dozen images that were taken as they flew through closest approach. So keep an eye out for that. I guess I'd just Google Juno, and uh, that will get you to the, the mission's website, and you can see um, these images as they get posted. Um, and so where are we right now? I uh, uh, captured this this afternoon, and so this is the, uh, 
Here's Juno. They've already moved well out beyond uh, the orbit of uh, Callisto, and so they're two and a quarter million miles from Jupiter already, and uh, on their way out. And so, stay tuned on uh, on Juno. And the last uh, mission I wanted to talk about is about to happen. Uh, the OSIRIS-REx mission, which will return a sample of an asteroid, will be launching on September 8th. And so I wanted to give just a very quick overview of, of this mission, and then once it's uh, off the ground, we'll certainly be doing more detailed uh, looks at it as, uh, as it uh, approaches the asteroid. And uh, this is just an overview of uh, all of the asteroids that we've had spacecraft uh, do observations of, and there's actually quite a few of them. But in reality, very few of them have done anything other than quick flybys. And so we had the, the near Shoemaker mission back in, uh, I think it was 2000, that it orbited the planet, uh, I'm sorry, the asteroid Eros, uh, flew past another uh, asteroid, Matilda. The Galileo mission had, uh, had flown past several as did Cassini, Deep Space One, Stardust. Uh, Rosetta has been orbiting a comet, but it flew past a couple of asteroids uh, on its way. The Dawn mission has uh, been orbiting the two largest asteroids, both Vesta and Ceres. Um, and then there are two Japanese missions, the Hayabusa mission, um, reached this sort of rubble pile asteroid in 2003. And uh, there's Hayabusa 2, which uh, has been launched, and it will uh, be uh, orbiting another asteroid when it, uh, when it reaches that several years from now. OSIRIS-REx will, uh, will uh, arrive at this asteroid in uh, late 2018 and we'll talk a little bit more about what it's going to do once it's there. So uh, it's intended to orbit this asteroid, which is just uh, oh, 100 meters or so across, a couple hundred meters across, sorry, and it will characterize the surface of the asteroid, and then on uh, July 4th of uh, 2021, it will very briefly touch down on the asteroid, collect a sample, and uh, stuff the sample into this uh, return capsule, and then head back to Earth. So uh, the asteroid that they're, they're intending to reach is called Bennu, and it's a very primitive, carbon-rich asteroid. And this, uh, this figure was intended to show how they decided which asteroid they were going to go to. So there's more than 500,000 known asteroids. Uh, there's only about 7,000 of them that are near Earth that we can reasonably uh, reach with a small spacecraft. Um, there's only 192 of those that have orbits such that if we go into orbit about that asteroid, we can still get back to the Earth. Um, there's very few of them that are uh, diameter in the neighborhood of a couple hundred meters. There's only five of those that are carbon-rich types, and out of those five, they, uh, they chose this guy. And the, uh, the philosophy here is that this is a very uh, well-preserved sample of the early solar system. And by uh, returning this to our laboratories on the Earth, we can tell a lot both about how the solar system formed and, uh, and look at, uh, at the possibility that asteroids actually peppered the Earth with the uh, materials necessary for early life to, uh, to start. So this is uh, an animation of how this mission is going to proceed. Uh, so once we launch, they uh, enter about a two-year cruise to the asteroid. They go into orbit around it and uh, spend a lot of time, uh, you know, two years plus, characterizing the surface. They have spectrometers, cameras, 
uh, lots of different instruments to, uh, to try and determine here's the optimal place to set down. They want both sort of soil, if you will, regolith, but they also hope to get into an area that has small pebbles that they may be able to, uh, to pick up. And so they unfold this arm with uh, what looks like a, an automobile air cleaner on it and uh, they very gingerly touch down and as soon as they hit there's a jet of nitrogen gas puffs out and blows surface material up into this filter and uh, they have the means of determining how much mass they've collected if they don't get a successful sample the first time they can try a couple more times uh, once they have their sample they place the the filter or the sample container in the sample return capsule and then they break orbit and head back to the earth and do a quick uh, flyby of the earth a few hours out they uh, drop off the sample container this is very similar to uh, what was done with uh, the Genesis mission and the uh, uh, my brain just went blank Genesis and, well, the other mission that collected uh, uh, comet uh, uh, material. Um, and uh, the, both of those were built by, uh, by Lockheed Martin, as was OSIRIS-REx. So there's a, a long heritage of, uh, of this type of technology. Um, so here's OSIRIS-REx uh, at uh, Kennedy Space Center getting ready to be put into its payload fairing. So this uh, image was taken about two and a half weeks ago. And uh, once they sealed it up, they trucked it across uh, to the launch pad. This was launched on a, or will be launched on a United Launch Alliance uh, Atlas V. And uh, here it is being uh, attached to the, to the top of the rocket. So the, the rocket is beneath us here. And there's the view of the, the entire launch vehicle. So there's a Cyrus Rex and the, the Atlas V still encased in its uh, assembly building. And so the, the launch date is uh, eight days from now. Uh, at about a uh, little after five o'clock, it's a two hour launch window. It's launching, um, yes, it's launching from Florida. So, uh, You'll be able to, uh, to follow this on NASA TV, um, and we'll have an update uh, next month. And the final thing I wanted to talk about is, uh, it's just sort of an interesting story. Um, uh, this is a European Space Agency mission called Sentinel-1A. It's a radar mapper uh, orbiting the Earth. And on uh, August 23rd, they lost a, a few percent of the uh, power output of one of the solar panels. And uh, this is a, an article that came out uh, yesterday in the Register, which is a, a British uh, newspaper. And uh, I'll just let you read that headline. So uh, when the spacecraft was first launched in 2014, it was a very complex deployment sequence for the solar panels. And so there were a couple of cameras on board the spacecraft where they could monitor if the, the panels were unfolding properly. And so they turned the solar panels on, and here's uh, an image taken shortly after launch. Here's an image taken just a few days ago and you see this dimple in the, uh, in the solar panel. Uh, here's a closer up view. They've, uh, that actually, it's about uh, two basketballs across. And so it's a fairly sizable dimple. And uh, the thinking is what uh, happened is they got hit by a piece of orbital debris, whether it's a, you know, a small, uh, chunk of rock or a piece of another spacecraft, they don't know, but the, um, the estimate is it was uh, moving at uh, about um, five kilometers a second, and it probably was about one to two millimeters in size. So they, they were able to uh, 
you know, say this is, uh, this is what happened. Uh, the spacecraft is safe. It didn't knock it spinning or uh, it's, it's only lost a little bit of its power and so its mission will continue. And uh, it's actually very lucky that, uh, that it is continuing because the next day on the 24th of August there was this large earthquake in Italy. And that's one of the things that radar satellites can do is you get before and after images and you can measure the deformation of the the surface of the Earth by, by doing that. And so here's uh, the area that was hit by the earthquake. You see this sort of blob here. This is a, a, uh, an enlarged view of it. And what that is doing is showing that the surface has changed from, uh, from the before to the after image. And by analyzing this in detail, they can actually make a map of how much the surface moved, and so in the uh, the center part that was uh, the center part of the the area affected by the earthquake, uh, the the drop was about 30 centimeters. So it it uh, it sunk about 30 centimeters, um, and it was sort of a well, it's an inverted bulge, I guess, whatever you would uh, would call that. Um, and then this is the east-west displacement. So there actually was about uh, 15 centimeters or so of, of movement along the, the fault, which is what we're, what we're seeing here. So they very, uh, very quickly could determine a lot of the details about uh, what was causing that earthquake. 